Okay. Can everybody hear me? I guess tell me if you can't. Um, I'm going to share my PowerPoint. And thank you, Miriam, for introducing me and Maria for the invitation as well. Um, and this is a great idea. I'm so glad you guys are doing this. Uh, okay. How's my screen? People can see? Great. So thanks again for having me. I'm Anna Malofsky. Yes, good. I'm glad it's working. Um, and today I want to tell you about uh, how the immune system is operating within the brain um, and how it parallels the way that we think of immune function in other tissues of the body. So I was looking over some of the other speakers and I saw a lot of people are working on brain immune communication with the periphery. In this case, we're talking about the immune system as a parallel system operating inside the brain, um, an area that we think of in physio physiology as not having uh, that much access to the periphery. But of course, those views are evolving. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, basically one story um, centered around the cytokine interleukin-33, which is what most of my lab uh, about half of my lab has been working on so far. I started my group in 2015. I should mention, by the way, that I did a postdoc with David Rowich, who's a glial biologist, and that's how I got excited about glia, and I hope to give you a bit of a feel how my career developed uh, over the course of the talk, too. So I'll be telling you that this cytokine, interleukin-33, drives microglial phagocytic function, um, and that during development, we see a role for IL-33 in driving synapse engulfment by microglia, which is important to restrict seizure susceptibility. Um, but interestingly, in adulthood and in the context of aging, IL-33 is also driving engulfment by microglia, but it then is engulfing extracellular matrix, uh, which promotes synapse plasticity and is required for memory formation. So that's an overview of my talk. Why do we care about all of this? <clears throat> so, of course, synapses are the essential currency of communication in the brain. Um, Ruslan Metsatov, if you've ever read a review by him, calls would call this the most tightly regulated variable. Um, this is the variable that determines brain capacity and function throughout life. And here's a very famous paper by Hudenlocker that shows synapses in the human brain. Uh, red line indicates the time of birth. You can see that synapses are increasing in early childhood. They decrease somewhat in adolescence. This is a normal, healthy process. And they decline again in old age. Again, probably a healthy process to help optimize brain function. And I'm a psychiatrist, as Miriam said. Um, these are time periods that we really care about in the, from the perspective of psychiatric disease because autism, autism spectrum disorders tend to present in early childhood. Schizophrenia tends to present in late adolescence to early adulthood, several years later in women than in men, leading to the so-called pruning hypothesis of schizophrenia, that too much synaptic loss um, is bad for the brain. And of course, too much synaptic and neuronal loss in old age is associated with neurodegeneration. Of course, as you guys know, probably, neurons are not the only cells in the brain. This is the kind of picture you may see if you read a you know, newspaper article about a neuroscience story. But in reality, there's glia everywhere. Half of the brain of the human brain is made up of glial cells, including, excuse me, astrocytes, which are kind of like the fibroblasts of the brain in some ways. They're the stroma, they're the support, they make the extracellular matrix. We have oligodendrocytes that are the myelinating cells, and we have microglia, um, which are not, they're imposters, they're not really brain cells at all. They are immune cells, they are brain resident macrophages that come in very early in development. And so we, we have gotten very interested in studying how these different cell types are talking to one another, and as it turns out, um, the innate immune system is a very important I hear a little bit of an echo. Can other people hear that? Or a noise? No? Okay. I'll keep going. Um, the innate immune system is a very important uh, part of how this communication happens. That is really what we think the innate immune system evolved as a way uh, for a multicellular tissue to sort of keep in touch. Um, and so this story uh, developed from the observation that astrocytes express IL-33. Um, that microglia express the IL-33 receptor, uh, and that communication between astrocytes and microglia drives synapse engulfment. And just want to give a couple of vignettes of how this story developed. So I was a postdoc studying astrocyte heterogeneity, um, astrocyte development, and um, I just 
discovered as I was looking through some transcriptomic lists one day that IL-33 is one of the top genes that um, is turned on in astrocytes as they're developing. Um, and at that time, I had a collaborator, uh, husband actually, who was working on IL-33 in adipose tissue. And we thought, isn't this cool that the cell type that I'm studying is so highly expressed, um, it is expressing so much of the cytokine that you're studying in peripheral tissues. Isn't this intriguing? And it started with an observation. I got this reporter mouse um, from that lab that had a laxy reporter driving IL-33. And you can really see that in the young mice, uh, IL-33 is not very highly expressed. And as they get older, uh, IL-33 expression is turning on. This is coincident with when synapses are maturing in the brain. And I want to point out a particular interesting thing. This little thing that I've outlined with dots is the visual nucleus of the thalamus. This is where all visual information is entering. And it's a neat thing about mice is that they're born with their eyes closed and then their eyes open uh, between P12 and P14, 14 days after birth. And we saw that IL-33 turns on almost like a light bulb uh, during this period of eye opening. So it's as if these astrocytes that are including this immune cue can somehow sense something about the maturation of that circuit. We don't know exactly what it is. This was work done by Elliot when he was an undergraduate in the lab. But what we do know um, is that it is sensitive to synaptic input. So here I've outlined the visual nucleus and the whisker nucleus that's sensing different information. And I can see, we could see, Elliot found that when he removed visual input from the eye, that IL-33 expression failed to turn on. This is quantified here. So in nucleated eye, IL-33 expression does not go up. So it's a cue, an immune cue expressed by astrocytes that is sensitive to experience. This was the first observation. And of course, the other, what made us interested in it, how did we start to formulate hypotheses about it? Um, this comes from following the immune literature. So one paper that I particularly loved at that time is about the ovary. Um, and this group found that in IL-33 knockout mice, um, the ovary accumulates debris. That's what this yellow marker for lipofusin is. It's showing sort of detritus in the ovary. Um, these ovarian follicles start to accumulate. This is what in humans we might call a polycystic ovarian syndrome, maybe. Um, and they found that macrophages fail to infiltrate the ovary. So I thought this was so cool uh, that this cytokine is driving remodeling within the ovary. And we started to really think about well, what does remodeling mean inside the brain? Um, and this is how we came back to synapses. Synapses are what are being continually remodeled in the brain. So just a little background on IL-33. Um, it is a nuclear localized cytokine. So it's weird. Most cytokines don't have a chromatin association domain, but IL-33 does. Um, and that's thought to be because it functions as an alarmant, um, which means that when a cell dies and the nucleus spills out, IL-33 comes out extracellularly. It can be cleaved by... Um, enzymes, a variety of enzymes, caspases in part, um, and it signals uh, to an obligate receptor, which includes this orange one, which is called IL-1, RL-1, or commonly used to be called ST2. I'm not sure why. Very confusing literature. And in fact, IL-33 does function as an alarm in the brain. It promotes repair in spinal cord injury and Alzheimer's disease and stroke. Um, it was not studied in those papers why it was promoting repair or how, um, but we became interested in understanding its role in normal brain development. Why is it turning on in this very interesting pattern as synapses in nature? So that's how the interest developed. That's how I turned from being a gliobiologist into a neuroimmunologist. And I'll just very briefly hint to it at the end of the talk, but we're really getting into neuroimmunology um, even more these days. So, um, Probably many of you have heard um, from studies beginning in 2007 in Ben Barris's lab, continuing with Beth Stevens and many other groups, uh, that microglia can engulf synapses. So here's a video of microglia. Uh, synapses are labeled with this marker PSD95. You can see that they are so abundant in the brain. Hopefully the movie will play. If we reconstruct uh, individual microglia and look at what's inside them, you can clearly see synaptic material inside of the microglia. So, Synaptic proteins end up inside of microglia. How are they eating them? We don't fully understand, but this is the process that's been called pruning. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise, right? Uh, microglia are macrophages. Macrophages are phagocytes. They eat things. Um, but interestingly to us, microglia express the IL-33 receptor. And so this gave us an opportunity to say, well, does IL-33 regulate this process, which is um, so poorly understood at this time, or was. 
Um, and indeed it does. So this is a very important piece of data showing that if we reconstruct microglia and we quantify synaptic puncta inside of the microglia, um, that IL-33 knockout mice have a deficiency in synapse engulfment. Since this time, we've repeated this experiment with many different um, conditional alleles. We can conditionally delete IL-33 from the brain, but not the periphery. Uh, we can conditionally delete the IL-33 receptor from myeloid cells, and we see the same phenotype. Um, how does this impact brain function? I just want to give a couple of slides of unpublished data right now. Um, and I apologize if a lot of the data is published, but I'm sure you guys all know what it's like to generate data during the COVID days. So, slower. So, um, this particular functional output is about the thalamus. The thalamus is the structure in the center of the brain, um, which is synchronizing brain oscillations. So, as you know, the brain is kind of pulsating on certain frequencies, right? We think of gamma frequency, about 40 hertz, as how concentration, attention, and focus. Uh, when we're sleeping, we have these lower frequency delta waves, that, you know, 0.5 to 2 hertz. All of these oscillations are critical for brain function. And sometimes the brain gets stuck in a pattern of hyper-oscillatory synchronized activity called a seizure, all right? And the thalamus is involved in both those healthy types and those pathologic types of oscillations. Um, and in collaboration with Jean Paz, who's an expert in, in the thalamus and interested in epilepsy, uh, we've been understanding more what happens when you knock out IL-33 um, in thalamic synapses. Um, and this is Raphael, who's an excellent postdoc in the lab, um, and also a wonderful electrophysiologist. And what he found when he patched neurons from thalamic slices, so he's getting a sense of uh, functional activity of these neurons, um, and these little spikes here are, are uh, miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents, which is one way of quantifying a functional synapse in vivo or in a slice. And we see that excitatory currents, in other words, excitatory synapses, are increased in IL-33 knockout mice, but the inhibitory ones are decreased. So this is what we call commonly uh, excitatory inhibitory balance. So there's more E and less I. Um, and it's a phenotype that's been associated with autism and, of course, with epilepsy, where the brain is hyperexcitable. Um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of data I won't show you where we looked at the synapses in more detail. Um, but the important question, of course, is do these mice have epilepsy? Do they have seizures? Um, and here I'm showing an experiment where we can do an EEG of a mouse. Uh, mouse brains are very small, so we use only two leads, one in the prefrontal cortex, one in, one in the sensory motor cortex, and we can just monitor the mouse's behavior once these leads are implanted. And what we observed um, in the control mice, you see the nice, smooth, flat um, EEG lead here. But in the knockout mice, um, pretty often, every so often, as I've highlighted in this little box here, we saw these abnormal uh, discharges called spike wave discharges. It's like a three hertz spike in wave, which is very characteristic of a type of childhood epilepsy called absence epilepsy. Um, and these uh, events were much more frequent in IL-33. Conditional knockout mice were using a human GFAP Cree promoter, which deletes IL-33 throughout the brain, but not in peripheral tissues. So these um, seizure-like events were much more frequent in these knockout mice. These mice are not having seizures. Um, they're otherwise look abnormal. Um, but it tells us that there's something abnormal about brain activity in these animals. Um, and again, if we... Uh, give them a drug that tends to produce seizures, you can see that the control mice will have some seizure activity, but IL-33 knockout mice have much more. Um, and that's what's quantified here. So this story is evolving then to understand how astrocyte IL-33 is affecting microglial function. Uh, we know that it drives synaptic engulfment. And one of the things that we're learning is that this process is very important uh, to restrict the development of excitability uh, and seizure predisposition. Um, and we're interested in turn, I won't show you today, um, mechanisms by which neurons are actually talking to microglia to drive engulfment, to maintain homeostasis. So this is what we call a homeostatic loop, which is so common in so many different tissues and is happening in the brain as well. Okay, so in the next part of the talk, I'm, I'm doing okay for time, I think. Uh, Hope to have lots of questions at the end. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the hippocampus, which is a brain region that is critical for memory encoding um, and memory formation. Uh, we got interested in the hippocampus mostly because I had a great student named Fee who 
came into my lab and said, I want to study the hippocampus. Um, and also because it's a brain region where plasticity happens throughout life, right? Because it's where learning is happening. We know that synapses have to be changing in that context. So this is the hippocampus deep within the human brain, um, where experiences through the process of synapse remodeling is encoded into memory. Um, how do we know that this is relevant? Uh, there's been a lot of drama, I don't know if you guys follow these days, about whether neurogenesis, whether new neurons are born in the, in the human. Uh, because in the mouse, new neurons are being born all the time. So we know that remodeling is happening in the mouse hippocampus. But there's been a lot of controversy about whether new neurons are born in the human brain. But I just want to make the point in this slide that whether it's new neurons or new synapses, the human brain also changes in response to experience. In fact, this is a study, that, a very famous study, where they um, did an MRI of uh, taxi drivers in London. Before they took a two-year uh, entrance exam, they had to study for two years. They had to memorize all of the streets in London, and then they had to take a test to show how well they remember. And before and after these tests, they could see a physical change in the size of the hippocampus. So clearly, there is dramatic structural remodeling that happens in the human brain as well as in rodents. Um, but the nice thing about rodents, of course, is that we can model this process very easily. So they live a very boring life, right? They live in a small cage. If you put them in a big cage, we're looking at the cage here, we give them a running wheel, we give them snacks, places to hide, we give them other mice to play with. You can actually observe um, an increase in dendritic branching in the hippocampus, an increase in dendritic spines, so that more synapses are being made. And so this is a nice paradigm that we can use to study how the brain changes in response to the experience. Um, so this is Fee, uh, who uh, we collaborated a lot with Mason Kierbeck, who is an expert in hippocampal function. I'm more interested in the cells and the immune side of the story. And so we collaborate with experts in these different circuits that we're studying to really discover more about them. And I just want to make the point, uh, first of all, that microglia express the IL-33 receptor, IL-1, RL-1, in the hippocampus as in other tissues other parts of the brain. But we had a surprise when we went to look at IL-33 expression. So we had access to this beautiful IL-33 reporter made by Marco Colonna, um, which has sort of changed our life. You saw a picture in the beginning of the talk where everything was blue, but we couldn't see what cells they were. Now we can use an astrocyte-specific reporter, which is in green, and an IL-33-specific fluorescent reporter in red. And what we discovered is that neurons and not astrocytes are making IL-33 in the hippocampus. Um, and I just want to show you here, this is the neuron that we're talking about. It's a cell whose cell body is in uh, this region called the dentate gyrus and whose dendrites project into this layer. Um, so why would this be the case? Um, not only is it neurons that are making it, but it's a different promoter. So we think that the way that neuronal IL-33 and astrocyte IL-33 functions is completely different. Maybe one is more like an alarm, and maybe the other one is more activity dependent. We don't know yet. Um, Leah, who's a, a neuroscience graduate student in the lab, decided to profile neurons in the hippocampus to understand whether this IL-33 expression was kind of, you know, represented some specific population or whether it's sort of randomly distributed. Like, we don't know which kinds of neurons. Um, and these are all the different types of cells, uh, different types of neurons that we see in the hippocampus. We're ignoring all the glia in this study. And you can see that IL-33 is expressed, in fact, in a distinct cluster, clustered out separately, um, in the dentate gyrus. And the neurons that express IL-33 are a very unique population. Um, they are very highly enriched for markers of synapse formation. So we think that these are neurons that are more plastic than other types of neurons. They express markers of cell-cell adhesion and markers of synapse assembly. So something about IL-33 is marking a population of neurons that are engaged in synaptic plasticity more. Um, and we can see evidence of this uh, in the living brain, in the mouse brain as well. Um, here's a picture of a neuron. We've labeled only one. Uh, we're ignoring all of its neighbors so that we can do these sparse uh, labeling experiments. You can see a single dendrite here, and then you can see the dendritic spines. There are these little protrusions, and each one of these is half of a synapse. So we can't see the other half, but we can count synapses. Um, and we see that this uh, spine density is much higher in IL-33 high neurons than in IL-33 low. Um, I say much. I think if you're an immunologist and you're used to like doing a viral infection and seeing things increase tenfold, this is not the kind of stuff we find in the brain. Um, so homeostatic plasticity in the brain, uh, these are the kind of big differences that we see, 20, 30%.
Um, and the interesting thing about these spines is that when they're trying to find a new synaptic partner, they form this little bud called the spine head filopodia. And interesting, these little buds, these markers of a new synapse trying to form, are higher, and again, in IL-33 high neurons compared to IL-33 negative neurons. Um, it's been shown, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more later, but I'll leave it at there for now. So IL-33 is expressed by a unique population of highly plastic neurons, but is it static or is it dynamic? So back to this environmental enrichment paradigm that I told you about, we can uh, put the mice in, in an enriched cage, we leave them there for four weeks, and what we find is that after enrichment, IL-33 expression goes up in those neurons. So somehow they are sensing this increase in activity, there's more going on, there's more to learn really, um, and IL-33 expression increases. Um, uh, whereas if you put mice, I'm sorry, this is a rat, in a social isolation, this is very stressful, it's a very isolating experience for the animal that tends to decrease learning in neurogenesis, um, we find that IL-33 decreases. So it's uh, bidirectionally responsive to experience. Again, with the possibility that it may function as an immune rheostat, a homeostat, in the context of learning. So all of this is interesting, but right, why does this matter? Um, this is kind of the experiment that we started with, in fact, where we can quantify its synapses, as I described to you before, by counting dendritic spines. Um, and we found when we delete neuronal IL-33 or delete microglial IL-33 receptor, that synapse density goes down, okay? This is the central mystery of this paper. Why, when we delete it during development, does synapse density go up? But we delete it in this adult region, it goes down. Um, this is what we really got captivated by and wanted to understand better. Um, and in fact, one more interesting piece of data, these are these little budding uh, synapses, like I told you before. It's a synapse trying to form a new synapse or change. Um, and we had observed, uh, it had been observed by Cornelius Gross's group, that when a microglia, labeled here in red, touches the spine, very often the spine head filopodia forms, this little bud forms. There's some idea that something about the way the microglia is contacting the synapse is driving this process. Um, and we found an interesting thing about these spine head filopodia. Now, when you put a mouse in environmental enrichment, these synaptic buds increase, so there's more of them. Um, because plasticity is increasing. Um, when you compare in gray IL-33 control mice and IL-33 conditional knockouts from neurons, we see that these uh, uh, spine buds decrease. But in the IL-33, uh, in the control mice, they're able to increase spine formation in response to experience. The knockout mice cannot. So again, there's an idea that there's a dynamic range of the system that's being impaired by lack of IL-33. Um, uh, so I'm show, I showed you then that there's kind of a necessity of this pathway for spine plasticity. Um, and next we wanted to examine whether it is sufficient to drive spine formation. So here <clears throat> we're using a virus uh, based on a construct that uh, once someone made a mouse uh, that was based on a similar construct where if you remove the nuclear localization domain of this cytokine, um, instead of being localized in the nucleus and sequestered away, it spills out indiscriminately from the cell. Uh, if you do this to a whole mouse, the mouse gets very sick uh, and dies, I think, a few weeks after birth. Uh, massive autoimmunity. If you do this to single neurons, the mouse is fine, but you can study how cells are interacting with one another. You can see here a bunch of neurons that have been labeled with this virus, and the HA tag dial 33 is spilling all throughout the dendrites instead of being stuck in the nucleus. Um, and what we find is that with this virus, uh, uh, it is sufficient to increase spine formation. So it's driving neurons to make more spines. Um, but if you knock out the IL-33 receptor from the microglia, this phenotype goes away. Uh, so just to focus then, it is sufficient to drive spine formation. Uh, and how does this matter for behavior? Um, here's the behavior that we use to test um, memory formation. These mice learn over the course of three days. We put them in a box that has certain smells and sounds. Mice are very sensitive to smell in particular. Uh, it's kind of a square box. Each day they get put in the box, they get a foot shock. They learn very quickly over the course of three days that this box is a place where they will get a foot shock, so they associate the shock um, with the context. 
Um, on the third day, we begin to test them, and we test how much they freeze when they get into context A, but they're not supposed to freeze if you put them in a different context. They should be able to discriminate context A and context B. So we can test not only learning, but we can test discrimination, which is critical to having a good memory, right? You can't, you can't just remember a place you've been. You have to remember um, the differences between familiar and unfamiliar. Otherwise, your memories will lack the precision that they need to help you function in your life. Okay, so when we ask them to remember where they got the foot shock, we notice that one day after training, control and knockout mice behave the same. In fact, they learn the same, so the knockout mice learn just fine. Um, over time, we find that the control mice can still remember and discriminate context A from context B, whereas the knockout mice start freezing all the time. So they freeze in context A, they freeze in context B. Their ability to separate those memories is impaired. Um, I, what, one thing that's most interesting to me about this time course, kind of thinking about uh, peripheral immunity and how the peripheral tissues are working, is that this is very similar to the time course of wound healing, right? You have like uh, a prolonged remodeling phase that can last uh, 7 to 14 to 28 days. And IL-33 is a remodeling enzyme. It's involved in type 2 immunity. It's, it's involved in bone repair and all of these processes that we think of as more chronic. Um, so these are the time courses that are particularly interesting to me. In the brain, this is approximately the time course that we talk about for between learning and the formation of remote memories, learning and remembering. Uh, so what's the mechanism? This is the kind of thing that's really most exciting and most interesting to me, um, and again has echoes of how the brain is really more similar to uh, other tissues than we might initially think about. Um, so we were inspired in trying to figure out a mechanism by this very uh, interesting paper by Roger Chen. Um, so Roger Chen, as you may know, discovered green fluorescent protein. He got a Nobel Prize for this. Uh, he died in 2016. He had a stroke in 2013. Um, and shortly before that happened, he wrote this paper. He is not a neuroscientist, so this paper was a little bit criticized by neuroscientists who were like, well, you know, blah, blah, what does he know, right? Um, and it's called Very Long-Term Memories May Be Stored in the Pattern of Holes in the Perineural Net. He proposed a series of experiments in this paper to test the idea um, that synapses themselves are dynamic and plastic processes, but that the extracellular matrix, which forms a lattice work outside and between cells, like the force, you know, it's in between all of us, uh, can form spaces that synapses uh, that encode the, um, the location where that synapse should be. Um, I just want to show a very beautiful video from a colleague in Bordeaux in France um, who has developed a technique to visualize the brain um, and to visualize the extracellular spaces of the brain. So here you're looking at a neuron um, uh, in its cell body and all these things that look like spaghetti are the dendrites. Um, and what you can't see that's even smaller are the synapses. So there's billions of synapses, and maybe a trillion synapses in the human brain. And you'll see coming through the center of the screen a myeloid cell. It's probably a microglia. It's probably very angry because the brain has been sliced. And the black parts um, are the extracellular sprays. So look, hopefully this movie works. Let's see. Mm, there we go. And now watch this. Chomp, 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 chomp. This microglia has chewed um, a huge opening in the extracellular space around this neuron. We're so intrigued by this process, and we thought to ourselves, well, of course, um, microglia aren't just engulfing synapses. They can engulf um, things in their milieu as well, and the brain is so packed, so densely crowded, that the only way to form a new synapse in some cases is to get rid of what's already there. Um, and so what's already there? It's extracellular matrix. So when we think of extracellular matrix or ECM, we tend to think of collagen, right? So most tissues of our body are skin. Um, collagen is the dominant uh, protein in the extracellular matrix. The brain has no collagen, in fact. Um, but what it does have is these proteins called chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. They're very highly glycosylated proteins, um, and they form a lattice work. The other main place where you find um, these CSPGs are in the joints because they form kind of a jelly-like substance. They're not like hard and tensile strong like collagen. Um, so we found ourselves reading a lot of papers about joints, about cow cartilage and so forth, um, which was a lot of fun. Here's what these proteins look like in the brain. Um, many people, especially neuroscientists, when they think of extracellular matrix, they think of these things called perineural nets. So this is a cortex. Uh, this is where uh, higher processing happens. And down here, 
is the hippocampus, which is the brain region I've mostly been telling you about today. The cortex has these neat little structures uh, that stain with a particular marker called uh, WFA, um, and they form around a very specific type of interneuron. And so people have been very interested in these perineural nets. They are a type of extracellular matrix that seems to be very relevant to uh, cortical plasticity, um, relevant to stress. Um, they tend to go away in the context of stress. And when new synapses need to form, people have found that these uh, structures disappear and then they reappear again later. Um, they stabilize synapses. Um, but there are other kinds of extracellular matrix in the brain. And here I'm labeling for one of the main chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans in the brain. I'm labeling for the protein now and not the sugar. Um, this one's called agarcan, and it's very dense in the hippocampus. So there are different types of ECM, but you can see this brain region that we've been studying has a ton of very dense extracellular matrix. And this is the most important slide of uh, this particular story. And it's the finding that microglia engulf extracellular matrix in response to neuronal IL-33. So here, again, is a single reconstructed microglia. You can see its lysosome, the, the belly of the microglia, labeled with CD68. Um, and you can see agarcan, this extracellular matrix protein, inside of the CD68 positive lysosome. When we um, diminish IL-33 signaling from neurons with a conditional knockout allele, we see less agarcan engulfment. Uh, when we cause IL-33 to spill out of the nucleus in this gain-of-function construct, we can drive agarcan engulfment. So it is, I won't say necessary and sufficient, but it is bidirectionally driving uh, engulfment of the ECM by microglia. Um, and we can find that um, these proteins tend to accumulate in the knockout hippocampus. So this matters for the overall structure of the ECM of the brain. Um, if you look at individual dendrites and individual dendritic spines, we find that this extracellular matrix protein forms a very interesting punctate pattern, almost as if it's associating with individual synapses. Um, and when we uh, use our IL-33 gain of function construct, which is, um, you know, releasing IL-33 all along the dendrites, um, what we find is that the this association, the surrounding of the spine by extracellular matrix protein is decreased. So, not very many spines are agarcan negative in the control. Uh, in the gain of function construct, many more of them become devoid of ECM, and this process requires that microglia express the IL-33 receptor. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm showing this data here. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm not showing it, but um, we find that if we clear extracellular matrix exogenously, it is sufficient to rescue the spine deficits in IL-33 knockout mice. Um, so that is a story then about how IL-33 in this context is driving extracellular matrix engulfment. Um, we're starting to have a better idea of how, what it's doing to the microglia. It is causing microglia to upregulate some very interesting matrix metalloproteases. Um, and we think, I'm happy to talk more about this in the question and answer. What's really happening here? Um, you know, is this really a phagocytic mechanism? Um, let's talk more about that later. Um, I'll focus here on one of the contexts in which this process seems to matter um, that we're very interested in pursuing further. Um, I don't have new data to show you today, but we have some hot off the press data uh, studying more how microglia are changing um, in the aged hippocampus and how the extracellular matrix impacts that aging. But what we did notice is that IL-33 um, is very different in young and old animals. So in the young hippocampus, most neurons in the dentate gyrus are IL-33 positive. Um, in the old animal, there's about a two-fold decrease. This is a big decrease, uh, much more than what we saw um, with experience in the young animals. Um, coincident with that, um, aged animals have a very interesting memory phenotype. So you be uh, maybe you've heard of studies where you know they show that young blood cures old age and stuff like this. What you'll find if you read through this literature this, is that there are very few um, behavioral studies that have actually shown a difference between young and old mice. It's not so obvious to understand you know what changes in old age, and so we were very excited that this assay, the same assay that we were using in IL-33 knockout mice, elicits a very specific defect in old age. Again, as I showed you that we train the mice to freeze in context A, we test their discrimination between context A and B, and we find that while young mice freeze much more in context A or B, old mice, although they learned just fine, 
have a much impaired context discrimination. And this is evident at least one day after training. So unlike IL-33, um, this is a static problem. So there's something already wrong with the old brain that is preventing this discrimination. It's persistent at day 14. We don't know what happens at day 28 because of COVID, right? <laughs> we shut down the lab, the technician went home. Uh, you remember those crazy days back in March. But uh, we know at least that this process um, sort of resembles what we had seen in the IL-33 knockout ones, impaired memory precision. And one more, so I've given you two pieces of evidence, IL-33 decreases in the old brain, memory precision is impaired, and we found this really cool paper showing that extracellular matrix um, is one of the main types of proteins that accumulates with old age. So they did uh, proteomics, um, and this is pretty much the main thing that came out of that study, is that um, in young mice versus old mice, there's much more ECM in the old mice and that this accumulation of ECM is associated with age-dependent cognitive decline. Uh, so we wondered whether we could rescue uh, some aspects of brain aging um, by causing neurons to overexpress IL-33. Now, I told you before, right, when we make a mouse, uh, these uh, other group made a mouse that's like spilling out of IL-33 of all its cells, the mouse gets super sick and dies. So we don't think yet that we have a way of like increasing IL-33 in the whole brain and really understanding anything about the biology. So we haven't tried to do that. Instead, what we did is we caused uh, IL-33 gain of function in very specific neurons, and we studied neuron autonomous properties. So um, dendritic spines don't really decrease in old age, but um, IL-33 gain of function can increase spine formation, just like it did in the young mouse. So this is not necessarily curing aging. It's just showing that we can drive an increase in spine connectivity uh, by IL-33 overexpression. Um, spine head filopodia, those little spine buds, which you can see here, um, do decrease with old age. This was actually a very interesting finding that has not been previously observed. And because IL-33 can drive the spine plasticity, what we find is that it rescues um, these plastic spines to the level that we see in young mice. Rescues, restores, um, the wording is a little tricky there. And so there's one phenotype that we can study very easily in old mice, which is um, excitability. It's been observed by many groups uh, that when you take mice and you put them in a novel environment um, for an hour, um, CFOS, which is an immediate early gene, turns on in neurons. Neurons get very activated in response to all these new things that are being experienced. And this is one of the main things that changes with age. In other words, the ability of these neurons to become excitable in response to novel experiment, experience decreases. And this is what you see in the gray bars here. So again, there's about a two-fold decrease in CFOS um, in the old mice relative to young mice after they've been in this novel environment. And we find that IL-33 gain of function, it doesn't really change that in the young mice, but it rescues this process in old mice. So this is not to say that IL-33 is what causes aging, um, but it does say that presumably increasing processes that drive plasticity of the extracellular matrix is an interesting avenue to explore um, for age-related cognitive decline. And we'd love to look more into, you know, either how IL-33 modulation or direct modulation of the extracellular matrix through more precise mechanisms uh, might help to increase plasticity. So just to summarize this part of the talk, it was published some time ago now. I look forward to um, talking about new data very, very soon. Um, but here's what we have at this point. Um, IL-33 is expressed by neurons in an experience-dependent manner. It signals to microglia, which express the IL-33 receptor, to drive extracellular matrix clearance. We think that this is relevant to individual spines, although we don't know that for sure, and that this process is permissive to allow synapse modeling. Um, and one thing that's really cool, as this paper was coming out, another group uh, who does a lot of studies, this is Kim Green's lab, does a lot of studies ablating microglia. Um, found that when you ablate microglia, uh, you can actually change a lot about the extracellular matrix. What they suggested in this study in Alzheimer's disease and a subsequent paper about Huntington's disease um, is that extracellular matrix is lost um, in these neurodegenerative conditions and that microglia are what's driving this loss. In other words, if you ablate microglia um, in an Alzheimer's disease model or a Huntington's disease model, you get less loss of the extracellular matrix you get less functional decline. So this is to remind you that everything which is good in the immune system can also be bad, right? And so this process, which is very physiologic and homeostatic and necessary for learning, 
can also be bad if microglia are chewing away too much extracellular matrix um, in the disease brain. And I just have one last couple of slides. I'm not going to show a lot of data about this today. I want to leave time for questions. Um, to say that we're interested in understanding how microglia are being regulated by cytokines, and not just IL-33. So IL-33 is not your typical cytokine. It is what's called a, a stromal cytokine. It used to be called an epithelial cytokine. It is expressed by tissue cells, um, and it's expressed locally, and it acts locally. Uh, what about other cytokines? The cytokines that are we typically associate with the immune system are lymphocyte-derived cytokines. Um, here's an example of three of them. We've injected the cytokine directly into the brain. We isolate the microglia by flow cytometry, and then we examine the microglial transcriptome. Um, this is work that's being carried out by Jerrica Barrett, who's a graduate student in my lab, and in collaboration with members of Ari Malofsky's lab. Ari is a tissue immunologist who focuses on innate immunity. Um, and what we find is that there are very distinct transcriptional profiles induced by interleukin-13, um, interleukin-17, and interferon gamma. These are kind of the three major arms of the immune response. This should not be a surprise, right? We know that these cytokines are different. They have different downstream pathways. But in the microglia field, um, where I think a lot of people still think of microglia as either activated or not activated or inflammatory or non-inflammatory, I think it's really important to make this point, simple as it is, that different cytokines are going to lead to different transcriptomic and probably functional outputs in microglia, uh, which are the main immune cells of the brain. They're the ones sensing uh, cytokines. Not that neurons cannot sense them as well. So I think future work from my group uh, is very interesting in dissecting microglial function one cytokine at a time. And just to remind you, um, you know, we have a lot of immunity that's happening inside of the brain. We have tissue resonant cytokines. We have a lot of sort of innate um, functions of complement and TGF beta and so forth, um, which I talked a little bit about in the context of IL 33. But we also have this whole other world of peripheral immunity um, type 1, type 2, and type 3 cytokines produced by lymphocytes um, can impact um, function and we hypothesize brain function in unique ways. Uh, and the regulatory arm of the immune system, um, characterized mostly by T-Rex, uh, can repress all of these other arms. Um, so um, I think one main question is, uh, you know, if these cytokines are impacting microglial function, where are they coming from? Um, there's a couple of main sources. One is the meningeal immune system itself, which I know your group probably knows a lot about. And the other is peripheral immunity um, and circulating cytokines from the gut and so forth that can uh, impact. And the question becomes, how are these things crossing the blood-brain barrier and impacting microglia, or even are they? Um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, I want to thank my lab. We actually just had a lab sort of very distance get-together yesterday. Everybody was wearing masks. We got a terrible picture. Everybody's standing so far away, you can't see anybody's face. Not my favorite. So I'm going to go with this old one. You can see the Golden Gate Bridge in the background here. Um, there's a couple of new members that I'm missing here, um, but it's an amazing group of people. You saw most of the work I showed you was led by students, by graduate students, postdocs as well, um, thanks to my collaborators and my funding sources. And thanks guys for being here. Please uh, send me your questions. Am I um, reading questions from the chat? Or Miriam, are you going to read them? You're muted. Sorry. I'll, I'll read them to you if you prefer. So you mentioned different IL-33 promoters in different cells. Have you mapped the cellular location of production of IL-33 across the adult mouse brain and, and human? Is cellular production region specific? region specific and does it change with age or inflammation? Um, I, I'm hearing lots of questions in that question. So um, one is which cells are expressing IL-33 where? Is that if I'm understanding the question? So have you mentioned the location of... So IL-33 is expressed by glia all 
all over like the place. So glia express IL-33 everywhere. In development, it's mostly astrocytes. In the adult brain, oligodendrocytes also become a major source. Um, and except for that one region I showed you, most uh, brain regions have a lot of IL-33 expression by glia. Um, neurons in the mouse brain are only expressing IL-33 in a couple of brain regions, and they're super interesting ones. Mm -hmm. One is the hippocampus, like I showed you, and the other is in portions of the medial prefrontal cortex, so the cingulate cortex. These are um, other brain regions that we associate with learning and memory uh, a lot, in fact. And so we're very interested in understanding why only some neurons are expressing IL-33. Um, and you asked about human. In human tissues, from what we've been able to see so far, and from a lot of transcriptomic evidence, Absolutely, IL-33 is being expressed by glia. Um, it's hugely expressed by astrocytes. In the human tissues that we've been able to see so far, we are seeing plenty of IL-33 expression um, by glia, but we're also seeing a lot in neurons. Um, it's always difficult with human tissue to really trust what you're seeing, so I'm gonna be a little cautious about that, but it seems like there's both glia and neurons in the human brain that express IL-33. And what we've seen looked so far is cortex, because that's the tissue that we to. Okay. Uh, he adds, and does it change with age or inflammation? Mm -hmm. um, so, as I showed you, neuronal IL-33 declines with age. Um, it's a good question whether glial IL-33 declines. I think we need to examine that more closely. Um, with inflammation, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we've looked after stroke at some perturbations and it seemed like IL-33 had declined, but we haven't done those studies carefully. Okay. Um, with regards to the epileptiform activity observed by EEG and IL-33 knockouts, uh, do you see differences in the frequency of their occurrence between day and night? Day and night. We haven't done chronic EEGs, so that involves leaving the EEGs on for two weeks and collecting two weeks' worth of data. Um, we, what we've done is record for an hour, so we don't know the answer to that. That's a great question. Um, but for sure, this brings up an interesting point, which is that oscillatory activity in the brain is different between day and night. Um, in fact, one of the main things we had to make sure we were proving when we looked at that epileptiform activity is that we were not seeing sleep spindles, but those are real epileptiform discharges. Great question. Okay. Um, thanks, Anna. Fascinating work. The ECM can also change the activity of microglia and probably also astrocytes. Do you know how the ECM dynamics affect the glia during learning and other developmental processes? Um, <clears throat> so, if I'm understanding the question, the question is how how are microglia responding to the presence of the ECM itself? How is it changing them? Uh, what I can say for now is that we've recently got back a single cell transcriptome of microglia um, before and after depletion of the ECM. So to deplete the ECM, we use this enzyme called chondroitinase, which uh, chews away all the sugars um, for a temporary period of time. They later come back and it basically creates a bunch of space. Um, and microglia change a lot in that paradigm. So uh, we are finding that uh, with age, microglia shift their transcriptome a lot, and that depletion of the ECM can shift them very much back towards a younger profile. We don't know yet how or what that means exactly, but absolutely, mechanical stress uh, is having this bidirectional communication uh, with the microglia. They are responding to the kind of crowding of their environment. By the way, Miriam, I see also some questions in the chat over here. Should I read those directly? Some questions in the chat, yeah. I'm going to take some of those as well. So I see a question from Max Reichman. Uh, it seems very convincing that the microglia are really involved in the balance. Did you have a closer look at the interactions with regulatory lymphocytes? Um, I don't know if Max meant Treg specifically or other subsets of lymphocytes. Um, We've been particularly interested in type 2 innate lymphocytes. And the reason for that is that although microglia express IL-33 receptor, for sure, um, type 2 innate lymphocytes express way more. Um, they express a ton of IL-33 receptor. And so 
Um, we think it would be stupid to look at IL-33 signaling in the brain and not consider how this major class of IL-33 responsive lymphocytes is involved. Um, and those lymphocytes, uh, we do think, um, have some role in regulating microglial function. Um, the studies that we do involve depletion of that subset. Um, but I would say that work is still very much in process. Um, I see a question from Ozgun here. Um, do you think IL-33 could have different sets of receptors in CNS than periphery? Uh, oh, Munich, cool. Uh, no, I don't think so, no. Uh, we are pretty certain that IL-33, uh, IL-1, RL-1, or ST2, is the necessary and obligate co-receptor for IL-33 all over the body. So, you know, tissues are tissues, whether it's the brain or the periphery. Um, we, we did think that. In fact, when we first started doing this work in 2015, we had no idea. We were like, well, you know, just because it's an immune molecule doesn't mean it's like having any kind of immune role in the brain, right? The brain is so special, it's immune privilege. Um, but more and more we discover the opposite. So it's the same receptor. Um, every time we profile uh, IL-33 knockout or receptor knockout, we can sort of generally phenocopy what we see. Um, we thought, you know, maybe IL-33 is a transcriptional regulator in the brain. It's bound to chromatin. So unlike uh, receptor-dependent activity in the periphery, maybe it has a totally different role. Uh, and so we actually spent a bunch of money profiling IL-33 knockout astrocytes, and we found only 10 genes that were different, nine genes if you subtract IL-33s. In other words, it's having zero transcriptional effect on those astrocytes, even though it's expressed by the astrocytes. So it's acting in a receptor-dependent manner, it's the same receptor. Um, and I have a Kevin, uh, Kevin Zuwalt question. Uh, great talk, have you done or considered any evaluation of mitochondrial function, either between cells or doing a during aging? Um, yeah, we did think about that, actually. Uh, for a while, we were staining for mitochondria. Um, there's this process of mitophagy, which has been very interesting in the field, very interesting interesting in aging and neurodegeneration. Um, but the short answer is no, I don't know. Um, there's been cool studies suggesting that um, astrocytes can eat uh, mitochondria from neurons, and that might be part of what's keeping uh, the brain healthy. And so it's a kind of phagocytosis, which would be very interesting to look at. Good question. Uh, shall I go on with the questions, or do you want to read them out yourself? Go ahead. Okay. Does IL-33 from neurons and astrocytes instruct microglia to selectively modify pre- or post-synaptic termini? Does IL-33 from neurons or astrocytes instruct microglia to selectively modify pre- or post-synaptic? Yeah. So that's a very good question. I think, I wish we had the resolution to address that question. In other words, is this selective? Um, is it kind of like happening in a generic way up and down the dendritic spine that can impact many synapses, but only some of them end up remodeling? Um, is it presynaptic or postsynaptic? Well, in the studies that I showed you here, um, we're modifying the postsynaptic neuron. Right? We're, causing, uh, we're causing IL-33 to spill out of the postsynaptic neuron because the spine is on the postsynaptic side, um, and we're seeing changes in synaptic connectivity. Um, but yeah, the, the real answer is that is a very difficult question to, to examine. It's very hard to detect IL-33. Um, when we were first doing these studies, we, would, uh, we were doing in vitro work, which we don't do so much anymore, um, and we tested 0.1 what was it? Uh, it was 6.7 picomolar of IL-33 was sufficient to exert its maximal effect on synaptic pruning. That's such a small amount. That is like the smallest effective dose of anything I've ever worked with. And so you think about it, like how little is enough to, you know, exert a biological effect, and it's not surprising that it's difficult to, to detect in vivo. But you would have to track a secreted cytokine, figure out... Uh, no one's asked this yet, but like, this is the biggest question. How is it getting out? Is it being encoded in synaptic vesicles of neurons? Is it um, non-vesicular? Um, I would love to know the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, do you know if there is systematic, if there are systematic changes in the current characteristic uh, 
hippocampus neural activity like sharp wave ripples and changes in IL-33 dynamics? Um, so the question is whether IL-33 is impacting sharp wave ripples in the hippocampus? That's how I understand. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question because it, you know, the data I showed you is a little bit apples and oranges, right? We knocked out IL-33 from glia, which is very rich in the thalamus, and then we measured patterns that are characteristic of the thalamus. Um, and then we knocked out IL-33 from the hippocampus and did different studies. Now that's just kind of a function of people that you collaborate with. Everybody does their own kind of thing. There is a group at UCSF that actually has done beautiful studies with sharp wave ripples, but that's not the group that I collaborated with because I guess those are a little easier to measure in the rat. Um, so the short answer is I don't know. Um, but that would be cool to look at. We've thought a lot about doing calcium imaging on the hippocampus, so we're more interested in kind of how different um, groups of neurons may synchronize with one another. Um, I see something else saying, oops, sorry. I like um, that. Is <laughs> um, there systematic circuit level dynamics? I assume that's a follow up to that question. Um, I mean, you saw yeah. the epileptiform activity in the sense that it's circuit level dynamics, although the epileptiform activity that I, sh ugh, sorry. Um, the circuit level dynamics that I showed you um, are about, are more thalamic dependent because the epsilon seizures are very characteristically. Uh, thalamic type of a seizure. So, um, so yes, circuit level dynamics are altered, but we haven't specifically looked at hippocampal ones. That answers your question. Sorry, go ahead, Miriam. Is there a division of labor between phagocytosis by microglia and protein degradation pathways within neurons? Great question. I love these questions, by the way. These are so fun. Um, I think so. I, you know, when I think about, let's talk more conceptually about synaptic pruning. I mean, the word pruning, I think, led a lot of people to think of like kind of a Pac-Man, you know, eating synapses away. And um, people, many groups since the idea of synaptic pruning have, has been proposed, have tried to visualize microglia engulfing synapses in the living brain, and they never see it. Okay. If you do two photon imaging of the adult cortex, um, you never see a microglia go up to a spine and like chomp, eat it away. Never. Maybe they're looking in the wrong place. Who knows? I mean, that doesn't, just because it hasn't been seen doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But, you know, to me, it makes a lot more sense that microglia are um, more passive phagocytes. Um, and this idea that the question I brought up is a really interesting one. Now a neuron, when it's turnovering synaptic proteins, especially the postsynaptic density, very chunky, very dense indigestible proteins, is it gonna shuttle that protein all the way back to its nucleus, millimeters for degradation, millimeters I'm exaggerating, but a long ways, or is it gonna spit it out into the extracellular milieu and let a phagocyte take care of it? I would not at all be surprised if there was some sort of an agreement between neurons and microglia um, to optimize the process of protein degradation. Um, that would be my working hypothesis. There's from the chat, do you know about a change in expression of IL-33 after brain injury? Yeah, I think that question, oh, this is not inflammation, this is brain injury now. Um, <clears throat> we are starting to look at brain injury. We've been using phototrombotic stroke and a TBI model, but we haven't looked at IL-33 expression. Um, certainly, IL-33, other groups have looked, uh, the Kipnis lab has looked, and several other labs have found that IL-33 is relevant to repair after spinal cord injury. Um, but whether it's expression level changes, I don't know. Um, it's expressed at very, very high levels. I mean, it's kind of, um, it may be a very stable pattern of expression, so it's, yeah, I don't know if transcriptomic levels of expression are relevant here versus how much preformed stored protein just sits in the nucleus. It's a good question. Is IL-33 expression restricted to the brain or, or can peripheral neurons also express it? Did you check any specific tissue? 
That's a good question. I mean, IL-33 expression is by no means restricted to the brain. Um, it is very high in stromal cells throughout the body, in the lung, and the adipose tissue, pretty much every tissue, right? Um, it's a dominant uh, stromal cytokine, um, epithelial cytokine, and some in lung and other tissues. Uh, but in neurons, nobody's ever looked. Uh, there was a super cool paper recently by Richard Flavel, uh, which studied interleukin-18, which is a kind of close relative of IL-33. Funny story, the IL-18 receptor is right next to the IL-33 receptor um, in the genome. So some kind of funky duplication event there, maybe. Um, IL-18 is expressed by neurons in the gut, um, and it's nuclear, uh, and it is signaling pretty far away to the, I think, the epithelial layer to regulate uh, gut function. Um, I'll let you look up that story. So there is definitely the possibility that some of these nuclear localized cytokines are expressed by certain subclasses of neurons in the periphery. That would be really fun to look at. If anyone wants this uh, IL-33 reporter mice and wants to do that study, Marco Colonna has been very generous with it, so let me know. Are there any mouse models that show hippocampus volume change due to placing them in a stimulating environment? Hmm. Um, not the volume, but as I've shown you this, um, dendritic spine branching and spine number change when you put them in a stimulating environment. Um, because in the mouse we can measure a much more precise thing like that, there's no reason to measure volume. In the human we have no choice, that's all we can measure. So. <clears throat> Do neurons express IL-33 with this question? I want to ask a bigger question, that how do, how do neurons modulate the environment around themselves by recruiting astrocytes and microglia? Mm -hmm. um, well, one way they do it is by expressing IL-33, which recruits microglia, right? That's what we were showing today. Um, <clears throat> but there's probably many other ways. I think, you know, one of the things that that single cell seek gives us the ability to do is to begin to examine these highly plastic neurons in more detail. Um, they were kind of cool neurons. They expressed a lot of extracellular matrix modifiers themselves. In fact, they expressed um, metalloproteases. So the neuron may modify its own extracellular milieu by sort of secreting enzymes that clear away ECM. Um, ECM is made by astrocytes. So there's a very cool dynamic there that we're interested in understanding. Um, I know we're at 9.05, um, so I, and I see Miriam, um, internet just went out. So I'm happy to continue, I'm happy to stop, um, but if there's any more burning questions, I guess put them in the chat and I will answer them here. I want to say thanks again, guys, for all your amazing questions. This was really fun. All right. I think I'm going to stop there. So take care. Thanks again for having me. Bye.